um, uh, phones and lines muted um, if you are not speaking. Hello, joiners. We will be uh, starting the program very soon. Just giving a little time as people are signing up. Hello, everybody, and uh, thank you for us at our virtual newsroom at the uh, America Society Council of the Americas. Uh, first of all, I just want to ask everyone if, uh, to keep your lines muted when you're not speaking so that we can um, have a, a funny conversation with everybody who is uh, joining us to this virtual meeting. Uh, we'll be discussing this critical role of the media during the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Cecilia Tornaghi. I am managing editor for America's Quarterly. I am a journalist myself, and I have been covering Latin America for the last uh, 20 odd years with a focus on policy, business, economics. I'm uh, originally from Brazil, but currently uh, based in New York for the last couple of decades. In front of us, we have this uh, global crisis with the coronavirus, which is definitely an immense challenge for society as a whole, but for journalists, uh, as we continue many, uh, right now, it's becoming very, very clear to society, the essential role of, of media, of journalism, when it comes to informing citizens and letting and bringing important information uh, to people at large. So in, in the face of this unprecedented pandemic, journalists are also part of this. We are also on quarantine. We're also having to practice social distance at the same time that we go out and inform and find the information for people. So from an operative side logistics to uh, navigating the politics of the different areas around Latin America to the health challenges to learning about medical science, journalists are showing up and upholding a responsibility that we do have to provide trustworthy, reliable information to a global audience and then just also uh, uh, playing definitely a very important part at this point. And I think people are more so than uh, starting to pay way more attention, 
especially my native Brazil, I've been seeing people thinking again on the role of, of the media. So today we are joined by uh, some four leading journalists who are living uh, this reality from different perspectives and providing the information and the knowledge that we need in this conflicting times. I very, very privileged to be here uh, uh, moderating this group. We have Laura Bonilla uh, joining us from New York, She's a New York correspondent for the Agence France Presse, AFP, and she has been working for more than 20 years reporting from posts in Brazil, in France, Uruguay, Washington, DC, very knowledgeable of the region as well. Uh, Naha Katan is the Bloomberg News Bureau Chief in Mexico City, where she joins us uh, today virtually. And she covers politics, the economy. And prior to that, was a reporter at Bloomberg for nearly a decade and is bringing uh, this interesting time in Mexico as well, a very uh, challenging moment uh, there as well. Tim Paget is the America's editor for Miami NPR's affiliate WLRN. He has reported on Latin America for almost 30 years, previously for Newsweek and Time, where he was Latin America Bureau Chief. He has interviewed more than 20 heads of state in the region and has just published a very touching piece uh, today that we will go into it uh, a little further. Tom Phillips, Latin America correspondent for The Guardian, based uh, in Mexico City and uh, right now in Rio de Janeiro, where he speaks uh, from. Prior to Latin America, he covered China, also for The Guardian, and is now reporting from my hometown right now. But we're all in the same four walls. I guess we're all in the same reality, even if we're in different continents here. Oh, not different continents, right, but we're different countries. So I want to welcome our speakers and remind everyone joining us today that this is on the record. And it's also being live streamed. So you can watch it also on our website, ASCOA.org, uh, AS or live on Twitter at, at ASCOA. So you can multiple ways of uh, following us today. I don't want to take your time anymore because I wanted to hear from our great speakers. So I want to open the, the floor for them to share with us the challenges and the hurdles and um, their personal experiences, opening remarks on what it's been like to cover this moment in, in time. And I'm gonna open with you, Laura, if you can uh, if you can take us forward. Laura, the floor is yours. Of course, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, as you know, there's a lot of uh, damaging misinformation about coronavirus that's spreading as fast as the virus itself. As we have learned uh, in recent years with the proliferation of uh, fake news, part of our shop uh, has shifted to informing the public on what's false and what's not. Uh, at AFP, uh, we have a fact-checking team that has created especially a coronavirus verification hub that's available to all online. Uh, and there we try to uh, debunk um, misinformation and give trustworthy sources to the public. Um, we, uh, I believe actually that during this pandemic, the role of an independent and professional media is more important than ever. Uh, people all over the world are thirsty for information that's reliable, that's verified and scientific. The spike is both quantitative and qualitative. There are more uh, people reading and listening and watching the news than ever, and there's more retention, so they are staying with the stories longer. Uh, this misinformation can come from ordinary people, from pseudo doctors or scientifics, uh, or uh, even from governments or presidents, uh, from Bolsonaro in Brazil saying the virus is to just a gripezinha or a little cold. Maduro recommending homemade remedies made uh, of lemongrass and ginger uh, to Trump, suggesting that an improved uh, treatment with chloroquine uh, can cure the virus. So our challenge to find is um, fact-checking all these claims and making uh, especially the people in power accountable uh, because misinformation can fool even the smarter uh, of us, and, and sometimes people share this information uh, with the best intentions. Uh, but there is there, there seems to be a fresh awareness that the information that's coming through WhatsApp or through social media uh, might not be accurate. Uh, 
Um, so uh, to the task of finding the best scientific information on the pandemic and debunking fake news, we have the challenge of informing uh, what's going around us, how this is changing the world we live in and how it's affecting all people. I am in New York City, like you, Cecilia, and uh, as you know, it's one of the global epicenters of this crisis. So for me personally, this has meant uh, talking to a doctor that works in the front line, that seeing almost exclusively coronavirus patients, or talking to food delivery workers that are um, mostly all of them immigrants, that have no papers, that can't afford to stay at home, or talking to mental health volunteers uh, that via Zoom or phone uh, are dealing with a tsunami of people uh, sometimes entering their fourth week of isolation and that are anxious or depressed. Um, one of our photographers is sick with the virus. Another one is in quarantine. Uh, one of our video reporters is in quarantine. So we're trying uh, to work and not to get sick at the same time. Um, but what I want really to say is I, I believe that now as journalists, we have a tremendous responsibility and also a huge opportunity. Uh, we have the responsibility to inform the public in the best way possible, as always, except that this time, and I think I am not exaggerating, uh, good information can prevent you or your family from getting sick and maybe even save your life. Um, for example, uh, are children or young people spurred by this disease, as it was said in the beginning, or not really? A small percentage when it's your kid. Uh, if you have kids like me, uh, when it gets personal, it's 100%. Uh, how useful is it to wear a mask? At first, we were told not much. And now we are told we have uh, to wear a mask when we leave uh, the house. Uh, so the challenge is also bigger because this is a new disease and even the doctors that have the most experience dealing with it have what, like two months, or three months, but not more. They are trying to find out what works, what doesn't. So the information sometimes doesn't seem to be very solid. Um, it feels volatile. Uh, but we also have a big opportunity because we have more readers than ever so now I think it's the time to show people uh, what we can do and how useful we can be. Uh, today I was speaking with a New York doctor um, and he told me health is wealth. And I would say also good information is uh, wealth nowadays. So as a reporter, I think it's the moment to recover some uh, lost trust from the public. And I hope we are up to the task. Yeah, Laura, it's a, sort of like a silver lining, and if we can find one for for us, is this uh, uh, reputation recovery for for a lot of people that that had lost. And and there is you talking about the dif different uh, information that we're getting, sometimes confusing on the health side. And so I want to make it not to, to Naha because also on the side of economics and finance and different plans that are moving around the world the world covering that is also probably a, a, a daunting right now as uh, countries are trying to discover what goes but i don't know exactly what what is it that is uh, on your on your ballpark right now but if you can tell us your you know what what you're seeing what your challenges are being right now thank you so much um yeah i would talk specifically now about bloomberg uh and you know where our coverage differs perhaps from general news uh you know we're, we've all become virus reporters experts uh very quickly on covering health issues but for bloomberg we uh will be covering a little bit differently than the rest um we are quickly shifting to talking about companies whether they are abusing the situation or being ignored by their governments. Those are areas that because of our, our roller, Rolodex of companies, you know, we, we can tap into that question. And, and of course, right now it's a health story, but when it evolves, many of our reporters will be uh, covering the recovery and rebound and, and um, hopefully how each country is doing their part to try and um, jumpstart their economies. Um, 
I'd also say that, um, you know, similar to what uh, some of you have mentioned already is that when we have this kind of new crop of populists in throughout the Americas, you know, we, we aren't just going to uh, a press conference or a virtual press conference and listening to what the leaders say and writing a story. No, we have to fact check basically everything uh, that that's being said and making sure that uh, the information is is correct. So we just we have a second layer of of um, you know vetting that we need to do that is really important right now. Um, I would also say th this question about social media. We are um, reporters, but we're also um, you know quarantined or you know sitting at home working from home so another challenge is and i think this might be more for general news but I, it works for all media another challenge is that uh we're seeing more coverage from traditional media of social media because there is uh you know just a lack of access to the streets directly um how do you make up for on the ground reporting when a lot of your reporters can't get on the ground so that comes with its with its dangers. I think the information needs to be extra vetted. Uh, you know, the, the reason for traditional media has always been, uh, you know, we need to be able to uh, fact check and make sure the information is right. So, um, you know, I guess just uh, an advice that whatever we do take or whatever media is taking from social media because of the lack of access that they have right now, it needs to be carefully looked at and carefully vetted. Um, and then just speaking more specifically on Mexico, because we've done a lot of reporting on, on the government here and the situation here. Uh, I would say that um, we need to tell the public about, uh, you know, whether the government is playing down or hiding information. Uh, and that comes with its own challenge because we get some pushback from the government or from the public that don't generate panic. You know, don't don't uh, say something might not be right. The testing is off, the numbers are off, and and you're generating panic. Don't do that. That's that's uh, the kind of response we're getting from uh, from some of these stories. But these stories are crucial right now, and um, sure. Uh, the, uh, they have to be done properly and they have to be, um, you know, esp especially well researched so that there isn't room for the media to be questioned on this. But, but this is when the media has to um, ignore the concerns maybe from government saying, oh, don't generate panic because the information needs to be out there and it needs to be verified uh, because a lot of times the governments themselves are not giving that information. Uh, I, you know, in, in Mexico, we were one of the first to report about questions arising over lack of testing in the country. And it, it just it um, got a lot of attention and a lot of uh, good and bad, you know, criticism as well. But that's that's our jobs. And this is, you know, what we need to do, because more and more uh, as time passes, the question of testing is becoming an issue uh, here in Mexico. And, you know, speaking to the point of the importance of media, I think, again, Mexico specific, I would say that the media here has has really played an important role in um, you know in talking about what the government is or isn't doing, and I think it's even contributed to the president's changing tone because for a while he had been playing down the incident, uh, the virus, and more recently he's he's come out and and, and stated emergency um, an emergency health declaration. Um, you know, he, he's changed his tone. Uh, so there may be issues with the press or me, he may have issues with the press specifically, but he also listens to what the press is saying and he watches the polls carefully. And there've been a lot of polls here in Mexico showing that his, um, you know, his response to the virus wasn't uh, what the people wanted and he's adapting. So, you know, again, they're an important, very important role for the media when the president of your country is actually listening to what you're saying and, and possibly even adapting. So I'll leave that there. Yeah, can that uh, be heard elsewhere as well if you can influence his colleagues in other countries? Uh, I mean, you have a point there. It's like it, it's a, a, a 
bringing out panic or reporting on facts. These, you know, what are they looking at? And uh, I want to uh, move now to to you, Tim. If you if you can, you know, uh, give us uh, your your view on this and where we're standing and what what the challenges are for you. Sure, I uh, I'd like to I guess launch uh, from Senator Marco Rubio's rather unfortunate tweet last week when he accused the media of uh, what was it um, I'm something like dancing for joy when we found out that the US had more cases uh, than China as I said very very unfortunate uh, on his part and I, I don't mention this to to criticize him so much as to bring up one of the points he made in that tweet which was he challenged us to go out and find out that China was actually uh, misinforming us, uh, undercounting the number of its cases. And it turns out the senator probably was right. But at the time, all he was doing was just uh, tossing out conjecture. That's not what we do. And I think our role became very clear in the aftermath of his tweet because then a lot of good foreign correspondents started hearing about these cremation records coming out of Wuhan that were beginning to indicate that, yes, indeed, the Chinese government had been undercounting the number of cases and the number of deaths. And what that showed was that, you know, we did not jump to the same conclusion that the good senator did just out of pure conjecture. We waited until we could actually grab on to good, hard, empirical evidence that a government was playing fast and loose with its coronavirus data. And I think that was a good lesson for those of us in this hemisphere because we are obviously, as uh, my two colleagues before me have pointed out, we are dealing with a number of populists and outright demagogues in this hemisphere who have agendas that unfortunately tend to steer them in that direction of playing fast and loose with data. Um, I would point out, for example, uh, I'm not accusing Venezuela, for example, of undercounting its cases. Um, however, when you see that Venezuela has recorded only 146 and its neighbor to the south, Brazil, has recorded as of today about 8,500, it takes you back to the Zika epidemic when Venezuela's government uh, reported only about 4,000 Zika cases, but all of its independent doctors organizations were reporting 100 times uh, that. And uh, so it, it, it's keeping our antennae out, is what I'll say, uh, to, to say the least. And, and same with Brazil. Um, we've mentioned already that uh, Jair Bolsonaro uh, has brought quite an agenda to this, this crisis, and we have to keep a very sharp eye out regarding the data there. Not just not just so that we can keep an accurate view of the number of cases and deaths, but also so that we can help Brazilians themselves stay informed about what may be coming. Because one of the things I have found as a correspondent on this story is that more than just telling the narrative of cases and deaths, we also have to be projectors because we have to recognize what the science is telling us about what is coming on the curve. And uh, for example, last week, we noticed that Brazil had a 4,000% increase in the number of cases over two weeks. And it showed us that Brazil was suddenly in the same place where Italy had been about a month before. And so despite the fact that Brazil's cases looked low, at, they were, we, had, we really needed to inform Brazilians and the world that what Brazil was experiencing was the same point, as I said, that, that countries that have been hit much harder were experiencing well before. To get them used to understanding the, the trend, the scientific trend in this story. So we have to be, as I said, both, both numbers watchers and science watchers to a certain extent so that we can accurately tell this story. And I think, uh, you know, as um, they were pointing out before, uh, very good points um, one of my colleagues just made about how this is, um, you, you can't be out on the streets in this story. And uh, I think 
this morning, for example, there were three very good reports by the NPR, Miami Herald, and the Wall Street Journal on the tragedy in Guayaquil, Ecuador. Now, obviously, a lot of that could not be told street level. Uh, the correspondents just did a stellar job of gleaning information from Facebook, from phone calls, and brought us to street level in, in that way. And uh, I would really point to their reports as sort of a model for how the rest of us can be covering this in this hemisphere as we start to see the cases uh, begin to arrive at the level of the Italy's and the China's and the Spain's because the science is telling us it may very well happen in countries like Brazil, countries like Ecuador, uh, countries like Mexico, uh, which uh, we have a president there who's not right wing like Bolsonaro, but left wing, uh, and it, as is AMLO's case, and he's got his own agenda for wanting to perhaps downplay the numbers. And um, so I, I think that, that, that for me, that sort of sums up when it comes to this hemisphere anyway, uh, how, how I'm looking at things. And uh, that's where I'll leave it. Yeah, yeah, there's there's uh, interesting that you point out to that a snub to the to to the press actually. Oh, let's look at this and brings uh, more actual solid information, which is it just which is an interesting way of looking. And that social media doesn't have to be uh, just an enemy; it's it's definitely an ally to reach people, right? Even to 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 be able to reach them and know what their reality is on the ground. Or, and uh, uh, Tom, you're like, you're going to move to you last but not least, in the, in the least. <laughs> uh, you are there where the pandemic is also next to a political crisis. So if you can tell us what the challenges have been on your neck of the woods in, in, in covering this odd, I, I guess, uh, example, which is Brazil and the fight against this, this, crisis, this uh, virus. Sure. Um, well, from our point of view, I, I think the um, the challenges the, the, we've had some very immediate personal challenges. We were actually on holiday. I'm based in Mexico City, but we were on holiday visiting my in-laws in Rio when this all blew up. So we're now uh, we're now stuck here for the uh, however long it takes. Um, so I think there are some very basic sort of logistical questions that all of us are dealing with. First of all, childcare, and there's a there's a three year old boy on the other side of the door, who, um, who is quite likely to burst in here at any moment and has, has invaded most of my interviews most days um, so far. So there's some there's some tricky things like that. I mean, it's pretty tough being a reporter at, any, at a normal time um, but when you've got no, one, no, no school for your kids to go to. That's pretty tough. Um, I guess the biggest challenge that I'm looking at apart from that is just mobility. Um, so Tim was talking about Ecuador yesterday. I mean, normally, as a correspondent in the region, I would be based in Mexico City, and if there was a big story like that to go and cover, I'd jump on a plane, I'd be in Panama pretty quickly, and on a copper flight off to, to wherever. Uh, yesterday, obviously, that, that wasn't possible. So I spent most of the day talking to a, a local journalist on the ground in Guayaquil, and then to people who were, who were there um, suffering the consequences of it. So I spent quite a bit of time yesterday talking to a a chap called Eduardo, whose father had died on Monday morning of suspected uh, COVID-19. Um, after he'd spent days trying to take him to a hospital, there was no room in any of the hospitals, there were no beds, he was sent home and he died in the early hours of Monday. And his body was put in a coffin and had sat in the sitting room for three, almost four days by the time we spoke yesterday. So, I mean, that's the sort of, as Tim, as Tim was sort of saying, that's, we, we're not going to be able to go to these places. We're basically all locked down in the cities and regions where we're all based. So we are going to be very reliant on phones, WhatsApp, technology, and local stringers and journalists in different cities and towns across the region to try and get the word out about what is going on. Um, and I guess we just have to thank, thank God for the technology we've got because not that long ago, it would have been really important to get these stories out. It would have been impossible to get these stories out so quickly. Um, and as Tim was saying, I mean, there are, there are I think many of the um, major English and Spanish language publications in Portuguese in Brazil here too have got really powerful reports today, uh, yesterday, about what is going on there um, and what may happen in towns and cities across the region in the coming weeks. And that wouldn't have been possible without 
um, A, technology, and B, much more importantly, fantastic on the ground local journalists. Um, so yeah, so I mean, I think over the coming weeks and months, we're just going to be more and more dependent on on that. Um, but it's it's really really challenging when you can't um, you can't get onto street level, you can't get to the place where you should be reporting a story, right? I mean, normally, um, I mean, I'd reported a story like yesterday, actually before about five or six years ago after a typhoon in the Philippines. And I remember I was driving along on a motorbike and saw a commotion on the side of the road and there was a woman and it was after after the typhoon uh, Hainan there. And she had, had kept her husband's body at home for five or six days with no help. But I mean, then you were there and you can tell the story because you're actually sat in in, you know, in the ruins of a house. And it's, it's harder to do that over the phone. Thank you. On the other hand, uh, if you were uh, if we were covering something that happened to others, and you, we go there and cover, and we can tell their story, and right now we seem to be telling our story as well, right? So we are in the midst of it ourselves. And as much as we're talking about that, there is more, uh, there is a lot of need for for this information, and definitely uh, we're seeing a spike on on people relying on on. Uh, mainstream, so to speak, but reputable media, but there is still an onslaught of misinformation coming from all corners and all kinds of, uh, of uh, WhatsApp groups, WhatsApp links and campaigns of different sorts. It's The onslaught is real. I just saw a small campaign here in the US uh, with some journalists saying, don't spread misinformation, but it's real. And uh, I would like to, to put to you, what do you see that is our role in 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 calling attention to that? Is it pe for people? We are all we are all news people, so we dive into news and we live off reading that on our off time as well. But regular people don't. They they want to watch they want to watch uh, uh, binge on Netflix and and uh, but and bang on pots outside the window. So. Uh, question is how or what can we do or what is being done? What are you seeing that we can do to actually help people discern what they are seeing and bring them to the information that is more reputable? I'll let's uh, move the, the order a little bit and just go to, to Naha for that first. You're looking at companies. I think it's an in, one interesting way of, uh, of, of, of looking at some reality that people won't have moment fake news, I don't know. But uh, how, do you guys have a sense of what anything can be done to help? Because at this time, misinformation kills. Right. Um, and from the company's perspective, they're not getting a lot of information either. I mean, specifically in Mexico, uh, most recently there was a case of uh, you know companies not really knowing whether they need to shut down or not, uh, because are they considered essential services or not? Um, and, you know, I guess at this point, our job is to report that that's their question and that's their concern and, and they don't know really what to do, whether they're shutting down or not. Uh, there was a question over the past couple of days about um, breweries, whether they can continue to to produce beer. So, you know, that's, that's one example. And I think what uh, we can do on the company side is just really... Uh, express that concern. There's a lot of concern also from companies here about stimulus and uh, what the, the country would do, will do uh, to help in the recovery. Um, so, so again, transmitting that concern from the business community, but also, you know, talking to the government about what their plans are and trying to get as much information as we can. Those are these, you know, those are two ways, again, from the business angle, that we can try and, and bring uh, more accurate information to the public, um, you know, and I, I can let other people talk about, uh, you know, more of the health side, but from the business side, this is this is one of the things that we're working on. I wonder if uh, uh, Laura, if you have uh, views on that, since you've been, you know, including talking to doctors and to patients, and if you have a view on that, if there's anything we can do. And uh, just uh, just before I go to you, Laura, just reminding people that you can raise your hand for questions. We have a question that we'll go to from uh, from uh, one of our listeners on WebEx that we'll go to right after. But um, Laura, if you want to. Um, yeah, um, I think that absolutely we have to uh, fight this information the, the more we can. Uh, it's, it's essential for us uh, and it has become uh, 
a key part of our job, I think. Um, different media are doing different things. Um, we have this uh, coronavirus verification hub. We're trying to fact check as much as we can. Some media have opened up their subscriptions regarding coronavirus and so people don't have to pay to read about the virus uh, online. So uh, I think uh, there is like global effort being done by the media uh, to try to keep people better informed and, and um, generating trust among the public. Um, it, it, is, it, is, uh, it is hard because we're confined, as all my colleagues have said and you have said, but I think the key part is trying to uh, transmit to people how serious the situation is and how much it is changing the world we live in without uh, alarming them and uh, at the same time without downplaying uh, the risks. There's a fight we hope to win when the, some governments are helping on the misinformation, right? That's <laughs> an added complication. We have a question online from Georgiana Martinez Garnelo. So Georgiana, if you can unmute your line and ask your questions. Yes, hello, do you listen to me? Yes, we can hear you. Yes, well, thank you so much in first place to the American Society for this event. I think it's really important, uh, the role of media especially in this crisis. And well, I'm the general director of the Global Youth Leadership Forum. My base is in Spain. And of course, I want to congratulate to all of you for your excellent job. And thank you so much, despite of the risk, of course. So my question is, how do you combat uh, fake news in a globalized world, especially when the government contradicts itself? as is the case of Mexico, when someone says in the morning something and something else at the night? Tim, would you like to take that one? Sure. I, I think the best answer and what the rule I've just been following is talk to the doctors. I, I don't think there's really any substitute uh, when, you, when you're trying to, to break down the misinformation. And I'll, I'll go back to Brazil. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro has been putting out um, uh, a lot of uh, so much misinformation that he makes President Trump look like a, a PhD in epidemiology. And one of the things that I have found I've, I need to do more and more when it comes to Brazil is, is call the people, the doctors at the infectious disease organizations, for example, in Sao Paulo, um, is what is what President Bolsonaro is saying is, is not only is that true, but does that really apply to the situation uh, in, in Brazil? Uh, he was insisting, for example, for, for, for so long that Brazil was somehow immune to this, that uh, it, 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 it was set apart from the rest of the world. I think he even uh, exploited that rumor that was flying around that because, um, you know, Brazil was in the southern hemisphere and it was enjoying uh, uh, summer temperatures when we were having winter up here, that that was going to make Brazil immune. But every infectious disease doctor I talked to, particularly in Sao Paulo, said, no, he, he's not right. And one of the, they, they would point out details to me that were very interesting. For example, let's not forget that the first case in Brazil was a middle-aged man who had just returned from Italy, from Milan. And one of the things the doctors were wanting us to remember is that no other city outside of Italy has as much Italian immigrants or people of Italian ancestry as Sao Paulo. And they were, they were pointing out to me that even before COVID-19 uh, took off as a pandemic in the world, the cross-Atlantic contact between Paulistas and Italians was pretty enormous. And, and that was well before Brazil shut down international flights. So they were very worried that factors like that could make metropolises like Sao Paulo, which is the largest metropolis in the hemisphere, uh, a, a sort of a ticking coronavirus time bomb. Uh, for Brazil, and which, which again refutes very directly and very scientifically a lot of that misinformation that was coming from people like President Bolsonaro. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard point to guess. So we have a question from Twitter um, asking you to comment on on the search for different content, so different stories that there is an overflood of content on coronavirus. So how do you stand out with your stories? Um, Tom, do you want to like to take that one? 
not to stand out with our story. Well, yeah, I mean, I think there are two things there. One is, and I'm sure we're all dealing with this now, um, coronavirus has completely overtaken and turned everyone's, everyone's lives upside down, sometimes in very mundane ways, sometimes in unimaginably terrible uh, direct ways. Um, but other things are going on. Um, readers will want to read about other things. And I think editors at The Guardian and in many news organizations are encouraging their reporters now also to report on things that are not um, coronavirus related. So that is one thing, uh, which is an absolute hell of a challenge at the moment, because I confess that I think in my pitch emails for the last two weeks, I've completely failed to come up with any ideas that are, that are not related to coronavirus. It's just so all encompassing, so such a big story that plays into so many different areas of our lives and politics. Um, as for how to make stories that are about coronavirus, um, I guess, how to get people to read them. I guess one of the big challenges is, is, is trying to work out now in Latin America what the different, what the most important themes are in each country and across the region. So just in the sort of, let's say, 10, 10 days, uh, two weeks almost that I've been back on, on this story after I came back from a bit of leave. It's very clear that in Brazil, there is a hell of a political story playing out at the moment. Um, and that uh, even before we've seen the worst of the humanitarian crisis that I think we can all agree is, is coming down the pipeline, there are real political consequences to the way Bolsonaro has reacted to this, to the way other politicians, governors, mayors have reacted to this. That is a, a big, big political story. Um, I think I think that's true in other countries. I think that's true in Mexico. I think it's clear in Venezuela, actually, that the, I mean, I was in Venezuela a couple of months ago at the beginning of the year, um, and it was looking like things had sort of stalled at the end of last year for Guaido, and then at the beginning of this year, there was a little bit more energy, and now we've had this new plan from him in the US in the last few days, and Maduro's trying different things. Really shaken up politics in a lot of different countries. I think that's true in Ecuador, too. I'm sure it's true in Argentina, in Chile, it sounds like there's a real impact. So I guess one of the things we're, we're going to be looking at is, is the, sort of the specific stories in each of those countries. Brazil is a very strongly political one. In Ecuador, the, yesterday, it was a very sort of urgent humanitarian issue. Um, and just trying to, trying, to, trying to identify and highlight those key stories in, in, from country to country, and also the key themes that link countries in the region. The political response has been, if anything, well, interesting if we were to have so much of a lunch, because it's been surprising in many countries. And it's like, oh, oh, you have that position, you have that. And it's like, it's not left, it's not right. It's there is no no yeah. ideological positioning on how people how com countries are responding to that, right? <laughs> it's been no in the words of one one Bolsonaro ally here this week, it's been gobsmacked gobsmacking. I'm trying to remember the original Portuguese word now that he said that, that we translated into gobsmacking, but I think about it. But it's been, Bring it's that still later. <laughs> we have another question coming from uh, Flavia Vigio, who is a, who is on a, on a call. So Flavia, if you can unmute and then if you want to direct your question to someone specific, you can say that or, or ask. So you can unmute yourself now. All right. Thank you, Cecilia. And um, my question is a little bit general. Um, it's how is it possible, if it is possible, to balance um, the coronavirus coverage with other things that are going on in the world? And I, I mean that because I was just so surprised this morning, um, and I'm based in Miami, I was so surprised to see news about the hurricane season coming up, and I wasn't even thinking about that. So is it possible for people who are just so focused on everything coronavirus now? to even think of um, other stories that are not related to, to the crisis. Uh, would like Laura, would you like to take that one? Okay. Um, I think it's extremely difficult, uh, as Tom was saying, um, for us, we are basically uh, almost exclusively working with coronavirus. And even if it's 
and other stories, it's, 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 they are linked inevitably to coronavirus. Uh, the census in the U.S., uh, how is it going to be affected by the coronavirus? I mean, um, I don't know, uh, a Broadway producer that was preparing a play and now is at home. How is this going to affect him? Because it's something that's affecting every person in the world and every business and, and all of us. It's, it's, it's very hard to teach something that's not related. And, um, uh, because our desks are a bit overloaded right now and they are overwhelmed with information and everybody's working from home, which is harder. Uh, I, I mean, we don't have numbers, but I don't think the productivity is the same when sometimes you have kids at home or, you know, you have, uh, so many things going on at the same time. So, um, we have been told to concentrate on, on coronavirus, which is a priority, you know, just to let people study and, uh, try to really think, um, angles and stories that have not been done already in France or in Spain or in Italy and find, which is also a challenge because these countries have lived all this uh, already. I mean, it's evolving, of course, but uh, we are not going to do the same story from every country. So we have to find a new, new angle. I was reading about a lot of sports reporters being pulled into coverage of, of the epidemic, right? So we have another question coming up. We have uh, Carlos Lopez, who has a question also on the line. So Carlos, you can unmute your line. Thank you very much. And uh, I don't know if I should put my video on just to show you here. I mean, New York, Manhattan, at home, obviously, as, as everyone. But you know, my face here is not the most important thing, the video. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I have like these, like two minded uh, head right now. I like half of my mind is in uh, Spain. I, I'm from Madrid, Spain. And my other half is, uh, is here in, uh, in, in the US. But something that I'm really shocked about is the last, the, the lack of, of the, of the loss of trust that a uh, formal media of big, uh, big media have, uh, from the public is, is very, is very shocking to see like a very, you know, like big big media institutions like El País, for example, in Spain, who used to be, and I think it still is the the, the main uh, reference in terms of you know uh, big uh, big media. Uh, the, the the loss of trust from the public is is huge. Like even you can tell in social media how people react to to the to their input is is very very negative. And I think that part of the race in this fake, fake news is like you know the 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 lack of trustworthiness. To, of, of these mass media. So my question is, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I tend to speak too much, sorry. But my question is, do you guys, can you guys identify something that was wrong, uh, was uh, you know, wrongly done in the past uh, by uh, big media companies that we shouldn't do in this kind of situation? And a second question would be, do you guys see this coronavirus crisis as an opportunity for mass media companies to return to that position, like that key positions to, uh, you know, uh, make them powerful in terms of serving the community and help them to overcome this situation. Tim, would you like to take that one? Um, sure. Uh, sure. I. Um... And, and, and first off, I'm, I'm sad to hear that that's the case in Spain, um, that there, there is that dynamic right now between Spanish readers and the Spanish media, because frankly, I haven't, I, I don't know what the, the rest of my colleagues on the panel, how they feel, but I, I really haven't seen that dynamic uh, neither in the United States nor in, um, uh, in, in the rest of this hemisphere. Um, in fact, I think uh, the coronavirus crisis uh, is, is helping the credibility of, of the media here. And, and we're always learning from past mistakes, as, as, as Carlos pointed out. I think uh, in this hemisphere, we made some mistakes in the early stages of reporting the Zika epidemic. Um, I, 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 there were some times when we probably weren't that helpful in helping people understand precisely the nature of the connection, for example, between uh, the, the infection of that virus and what happens to uh, fetuses. 
for example. Um, and it, you know, but 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 we we learned pretty quickly, I think. Um, so Carlos is right. We we do learn from past mistakes. But on this, I again, I don't know particularly the uh, the situation in Spain. Uh, my wife's Venezuelan. I have nieces and nephews living in Madrid right now. But um, I can only speak for my country and the rest of this hemisphere. I think that the media have been. Um, t take a look at Mexico, for example. I think they've. I think they've been confronting um, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador's ca very cavalier attitude toward this virus there. And I. And I think uh, you know, as Naha was pointing out, um, I, I think that they have helped push him in in a, in a more responsible direction. So I think I think one of the silver linings of, of this tragedy is that when it's all done, I, I do think the media are going to uh, come out of this a, a more respected and credible institution than perhaps many world leaders uh, were trying to make us out as. Thank you. We are getting close to, to the end. We do have a lot of questions here, so I'll try to go through a couple more uh, before we go. Uh, maybe Naha, maybe you want to take this one that uh, Erica Quintero has highlighted that Peru had issued this shopping rules here for men, men and women different days of the week. So, and no one has really uh, raised the gender issue of this decision. If it is something, a uh, highlight that uh, this even unique. This is something that it should have been uh, taken and and considered in coverage. The fact that the gender was considered, and then after now, I'll just leave the second question here. If anyone has examples of exemplary media coverage of coronavirus in Latin America, from Jose Barnes from the American Chamber of Commerce in Mexico. So I'll leave you the second question for everybody to think for your closing remarks and uh, the Peru question. Naha, would you like to take a shot of that one? Sure. I also wanted to just add to what's been said before about uh, mistakes or what, what the media can do now. I think I agree that it has a very important role and it's taken a very important role. But I also think that um, the media does need to be careful. And I'm talking about Mexico specifically because, you know, this is what I've been covering for many years to not get into kind of a shouting match with the government because the government, uh, well, the, the president right now really does have issues with the media. He, he raises them at the morning press conference with the Mañanera and he, you know, he antagonizes the media. And then sometimes some media does respond or does kind of report on things that are not as essential, you know, like how many um, feet in between each uh, minister, is it enough? you know, the distance between. So I think it's important to also um, just prioritize and focus on the bigger the bigger issues. I mean, that's one thing I would just add to that. And then um, on gender, uh, yeah, we saw the, the story coming across from Peru. Um, and, you know, in Mexico, you, there's been a lot of discussion about uh, whether work from home and, and just people being locked up could actually uh, increase um, domestic violence or, or, you know, problems that have already been, you know, steeped in this, in, you know, Mexico right now and in the problems that uh, Mexico is facing with, with violence. So, you know, that's been something that's raised by some government officials. It's been raised in the media. Uh, I think it's a really important question to uh, keep, keep gender issues, um, you know, in, in the coverage, in our focus. Uh, it really is something that I think in Peru, there could be, you know, discussion about that in the media because it is, uh, it's a very strange, um, it's a very strange measure. Uh, you know, we're saying how in Mexico, they've already divided cars between men and women in the subways because of, of, of problems with assault on the subways. So, um, you know, in all of Latin America, Gender violence is a very important issue, and gender equality is is something that really needs to be addressed, and I think should be addressed in the media, in the times of the virus as well. This is an issue that uh, is going to remain, just as violence in general in the region is going to continue uh, to be important to cover despite the virus. In fact, because of the virus, there might be less um, policing or or more isolation among. Uh, you know, different communities or more remote communities, and that could actually increase both uh, domestic violence and regular violence. These are all issues that I think we need to keep reporting, uh, despite the big health issue that we're seeing. 
And breaking up between men and women to go out might just be half of the population goes out two, three days a week, the other half, the other half. It could be just just that simple also, right? A, a quick way of dividing us. A quick lightning round. We have just uh, three minutes to, 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 to close here, but a quick lightning round. If you have any examples of exemplary coverage in, in local news, not fair to have our own. So in local news, any cities, anywhere, do you have any examples? Tom, I'll start with you. I give you two very good ones from Brazil. I think. I mean, it's it's so it is it is a moment for really good, truthful reporting. There's been fantastic coverage of of the situation in the Folha de São Paulo. Uh, critical, fact based, human, brilliant reporting. And I, and this might be a controversial thing to say for some, but I, th I think also some of the coverage that um, the Global has done has been fantastic. And you really see why politicians like Bolsonaro are trying so hard to discredit the mainstream media because when you turn on the television on Sunday night and watch Fantastical and the program was pretty much beginning to end coronavirus um, moving they were there in the hospitals they were there in the graveyards they were talking to the scientists it was fantastic and on one of the news programs a couple of days ago on global they even got two gadis two dust two dustbin men to close the program with the message that Bolsonaro doesn't want anyone to hear, which was stay at home. So they got two dustbin men to completely trash Bolsonaro's message on coronavirus. And it was witty and powerful. And I thought it was very, very clever journalism. Indeed. Tim, do you have any any examples that, you, that you've seen in local news that you'd like to highlight? Yes, but, uh, but first, I just want to uh, tell Tom, I didn't mean to be so Yankee-centric when I was uh, pointing out the great uh, Guayaquil reporting um, uh, earlier. And now that I know that you've written a piece, which by your narrative sounds sounds like a, a very moving piece itself, I, I will now read that. Um, again, didn't mean to be Yankee-centric. Um, but we have many readers in the US too. <laughs> okay, <laughs> right. Separated by a common language. Um, but I, but I will, yes, I will point out in the Miami Herald uh, this morning. Antonio Maria Delgado, my 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 colleague who usually covers Venezuela, wrote a stellar piece about a country that is also whose leadership is also being very cavalier about this uh, crisis, uh, Nicaragua and the Ortega regime. And he put together a piece that obviously done by telephone from Miami, but really made you feel as if you were on the ground in Managua and and these other uh, small towns in Nicaragua and how people there were reacting to the Ortega regime's, again, very irresponsible uh, cavalier attitude toward uh, how people should be responding to this. So um, my, my hat's off to Antonio. Laura, any example in a quick like, lightning round here? Yeah, I, I don't want to choose just one example, but just speaking in general of the role of independent media in Venezuela. I think um, that they're going to be for, for the rest of the international media too. Uh, in Venezuela, there are only 84, I think, intensive care units. Uh, hospitals don't have electricity uh, in, a, in a continuous way. They don't have water in a continuous way. Uh, this is going to be very challenging for the country. Uh, as we know, the information coming from the government uh, is far uh, from being um, accurate, I believe. Uh, so uh, all uh, independent journalists in, in Venezuela working in, in different kinds of media are going to be key for, for the rest of us. Thank you. Now, I'm not close with you. Any local news that you would highlight as a, as a good example? Well, also, I don't, I don't want to um, specifically mention any in any one newspaper, but as I have said before, I think the, the media here in Mexico, the local media has done a great job of, you know, um, raising the questions, talking to the experts, et cetera, to make a lot of Mexicans aware of the, the seriousness of this crisis. When I think for a long, for at least a few weeks, um, I had heard of people saying, this is not real. This is just a, you know, a conspiracy theory from the rich nations. I mean, there's, you know, and, and I think that the local media has done a great job of informing the public and bring to task, you know, the president and his, and his attitude and helping change, I think, at least to some extent that attitude. So just reinforcing that I think that that was um, something that the media has done very well here. 
Thank you. I want to thank you. I want to thank our guest speakers, Laura, Naha, Tim, Tom. I want to thank you all. I want to uh, encourage everybody here to follow them, follow their work. Follow us too, America's Quarterly, but follow them. I mean, they're writing, they're providing really important uh, 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 help, information, and support right now. Uh, sorry that we couldn't get to all the answers. We're really running out of time, but thank you so much for, for being in our virtual room. The Council of the Americas, we're striving to continue to provide our members and community with uh, relevant content during this critical time. Uh, if you have any comments, thoughts, please feel free to contact our team and follow on our website. We keep uh, adding different discussions on different areas and topics of this unprecedented uh, uh, crisis, global crisis, and uh, mostly its effect on Latin America and uh, the hemisphere. So thank, thank you. you all for being with us. Thank you to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank so much. you. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Very good meeting. Thank you.